We're going to learn about some Bayesian statistics. Uh, I've got a link there. You should probably already have this link if you signed up ahead of time. Maybe you got a chance to do the setup. If you're just joining and you haven't done the setup yet, that's fine. You can start now, although try to also pay attention. Uh, if you run into any problems, uh, we can help out a little bit, and Matt in the back is going to help us out as well. And also, take advantage of your neighbors. One of the nice things about SciPy is that we're all here to learn. We all know different stuff, so we can help each other out. So that's the plan. I'm Alan Downey. I teach at Olin College, which is just outside of Boston. Boston, I have to say that carefully when you're in Austin. So I'm from Boston. Uh, this is, it's a new engineering school. We started about 15 years ago. We are trying to fix engineering education. So if you're interested in that and you want to talk about engineering education, let's talk. Primary thing we're going to work on today, Bayesian statistics. Starting very basic, I'm going to start with the laws of probability and work my way up. So ideally, you don't have to know anything. I'm going to assume that you know a little bit of Python. That'll help. And we're going to work our way up. We're going to do a computational framework and then a series of example problems. So I've got three Jupyter notebooks we're going to work through. And as you might know, we have a Bayesian track in the conference this year. Kind of coincidentally, we had three people propose Bayesian tutorials that kind of go together in a sequence. And so we worked with each other a little bit to make them work together. Out of curiosity, how many of you are signed up for all three of the Bayesian tutorials? All right. I think if things went according to plan, that we have a prize for you at the end. <laughs> but but you, have to, you have to get through all three of them. <laughs> so hopefully by the end of this morning, You'll be ready to solve problems that are similar to the ones we do this morning and write Python code to implement those solutions. And you'll be ready to go on and learn more, partly from the other tutorials if you're doing those. And also, I'm going to give you some resources at the end. All right, as I said, I'm going to start with the laws of probability. This is it. This is what you need to know. Or really, this is the notation. So, P of A, P parenthesis A, just means the probability that something happens, A, some event. A and B means that both of them occur. And then the conditional probability of A given B, that vertical bar is pronounced given, the, con the probability of A given that we know that B occurred. That's it. We're going to need the conjunction rule. And the conjunction rule says that if I want to know the probability of A and B, what I want is the intersection of those two circles. And I can compute that by starting with the probability of A, so the yellow circle. And then what fraction of those are also B? So that's one way to find that intersection. The other way to find that intersection is the other way around. This is completely symmetric, so I can write it both ways. I can say, OK, well, what's the probability of B first? And then what's the probability of A given that I know B? So I'm going to just assert that those two things are equal, not quite proving this. But if you're willing to accept that, then I can set those two sides equal to each other. So this is just two ways of computing that conjunction. And then if I divide through by B, the probability of B, that's Bayes' theorem. So we kind of just proved Bayes' theorem, at least based on a certain assumption. And this now is the foundation of all Bayesian statistics. If you've got this, this is really all there is to Bayesian statistics. So we're good. By the way, this, uh, there's a cafe in London that has this neon sign of Bayes' theorem. If you happen to be in London, you happen to go to that cafe, you happen to steal it, you happen to put it in the mail and send it to me, I would not you know, object. <laughs> OK, um, so we have Bayes' theorem. There are now there are two ways to think about what Bayes' theorem is. So one way is it's just a way to compute conditional probabilities. If you happen to have the probability of B given A, and what you really wanted was the probability of A given B, Bayes' theorem gives you a way to go back and forth. And sometimes, if the right-hand side here is easier to compute for whatever reason, then the left, 
Bayes theorem helps you out. It's a divide and conquer strategy that says if I don't know the thing on the left, but I do know the things on the right, I can solve it. But that is not primarily how we're going to use Bayes' theorem. When we're talking about Bayesian statistics, we're usually thinking about what I call the diachronic interpretation. Diachronic is Greek for through time. And the idea is that you have some hypothesis, you observe some data, you use the data to update what you believe about the world in time. So what you believed before you saw the data and then what you believe after you saw the data. So that conditional probability of H given D is how strongly do I believe the hypothesis given that I've ha I have observed the data. For people who are coming in, don't worry, get settled in. We're going to pause in a couple of minutes to get set up and get the software going and all that. And there are a couple of seats, so just kind of filter in. We'll be good. All right. So I'm going to start with a really simple problem. This is classic probability class. It's usually marbles in urns, but this is a problem I took from Wikipedia, and it's the cookies in bowls, but the math is the same. So the idea is I have two bowls. They have different probabilities of having a chocolate and a vanilla cookie. So bowl number one is mostly vanilla. Bowl number two is 50-50. If I pick a bowl at random, pick a cookie at random, and it turns out to be a vanilla cookie, what's the probability that the bowl that I picked was bowl one? This seems like a silly problem, but once we start adding to this problem, we, we are actually going to solve a useful problem using this mechanism. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to define the probability before I saw the data, which is the hypothesis that the cookie came from bowl one. And then I'm going to take the vanilla cookie, that's what I observed, that's my data. I'm going to do an update. We're going to do a Bayesian update to compute the probability of bowl one given the vanilla cookie. Let me lay out these terms. They all have vocabulary. So the thing we want is called the posterior probability. That's after I see the data, hence posterior. I'm going to start with my prior probability, prior because I haven't seen the data yet. What I'm going to use is the conditional likelihood of the data, which is what's the probability of seeing a vanilla cookie if it is in fact bowl one? And then the denominator is the total probability of the data. What's the probability of getting a vanilla cookie under any circumstances at all? Let me fill in the, the details here and that might become clearer. So again, that's Bayes' theorem at the top, just written out on one line. And now I can start to think about this problem and plug in the probabilities. And this again, this is the divide and conquer strategy. I can think of each of the pieces individually and then put them together. So the prior probability, I had two bowls, I chose them at random. I didn't say explicitly that it was 50-50, but now that we think about it, okay, let's say that it's 50-50. The conditional likelihood of the data says, if I know for sure that it's bowl one, what's the probability of getting a vanilla cookie? And that's given to us by the statement of the problem, three quarters. Because in bowl one, three quarters of the cookies are vanilla. The denominator is a little bit tricky. We're going to solve this a couple of different ways. But for now, I'm just going to do it in my head and say, of all the cookies in both bowls, five-eighths of them are vanilla. So the total probability under any hypothesis is 5 eighths. That might not be entirely clear. I'm going to come back and clean that up a little bit. But if you'll let me get away with a little hand wave there, I can now take those three numbers, plug them into Bayes' theorem, and the result is 3 fifths. So that's my posterior probability that it was bowl one, given that I saw a vanilla cookie. Which makes sense, or at least I want to help you develop a little bit of intuition for this. I went from 50-50. It could have been bowl one or bowl two. I saw a vanilla cookie, and having seen that, my cookie-o-meter has shifted over to about 60%. Because the data I saw, the vanilla cookie, was more likely under the bowl one hypothesis than under the bowl two hypothesis. And therefore, it is evidence in favor of bowl one, 
and that's why my probability shifted toward pole one. And Bayes' theorem tells me exactly how, by how much. In this case, from 50 to 60% is not a huge swing because one vanilla cookie doesn't provide particularly strong evidence. All right. So I'm, we're going to solve this, this problem three ways. <laughs> I just did the first one. Second thing I'm going to do is what I'm going to call a, a table method for solving Bayesian problems. And that's going to take us to the third way, which is using Python. So I want to do two things. First, if you click on that table, it'll take you to a spreadsheet. And we're going to fill in that spreadsheet to solve Bayes' theorem. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So you'll see what that looks like. And Google will ask you if you want to make a copy. And you do. And then it'll give you this is kind of a blank sheet for solving Bayes' problems. Now, I suspect that some of you have company laptops or government laptops, and you're not allowed to do this. <laughs> and in that case, you're going to make friends with a neighbor. And in fact, even if you are allowed to do this, you're still going to make friends with your neighbor, because this is a good time to take advantage of the learning community that you have joined. As I mentioned, SciPy, we are all here to learn stuff. And one of the things you will learn, you will learn from your neighbors. So take a minute, introduce yourselves. Here are a couple of ice-breaking questions. What was the first computer you used? First programming language you learned? What do you use Python for? Chat with each other a little bit. Get set up with that spreadsheet. I'll come around and say hello. We'll start up in five minutes. We have a system that we use at Olin, which is kind of embarrassingly like kindergarten, but it works. Which is, when you're ready to resume, I'll raise my hand. If you see me raising my hand, then you have to stop talking and you raise your hand, and then other people see you and it, and it propagates. And it works really well. Although I will say one time I was talking to another member of the faculty, and uh, he saw the speaker raised their hand, and so he raised his hand, but he kept talking to me while he was raising his hand. <laughs> you can't know, that's not the rules. <laughs> uh, okay, so I started brutally on time. Uh, if you came in late, don't worry. You will have a chance to catch up. We're gonna do some setup as we go along. So first thing, if you did come in late, grab this URL. This is where all the setup instructions are. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to get that done. If you haven't done it ahead of time, you'll be able to catch up. And then the other thing, if you came in late, we are currently here. Oh, by the way, the, that link, if you get to there, let me do it. Follow that link. One of the links that you will find there is the link to these slides. So you can follow along. And then once you get to the slides, you can get to the setup instructions. Well, okay, don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you've got the slides, you've got the setup instructions, and if you are here on the spreadsheet, right, there's a link to the spreadsheet. So, good, hopefully you've got this now. And again, to make a copy. So this is a template for solving Bayes problems. Too big. Got it. Thanks, Google. Good. OK. So the first column is where we're going to put the hypotheses. And once I figure out how to type. So the first one is the hypothesis that the cookie came from bowl one. Second is the hypothesis that it came from bowl two. And for this problem, we only have two, two hypotheses, so let's wipe out the other two. For my priors, I've got 50-50, so 0.5 and 0.5. And make sure that you zero out these other two. So now I've got my priors. 
and all I have to figure out are the likelihoods. So if I chose the cookie from bowl one, the probability of getting a vanilla cookie is three quarters because that was part of the statement of the problem. In bowl one, three quarters of the cookies are vanilla. In bowl two, three quarters of the cookies are, oops, sorry, half of the cookies are vanilla. So that's 0.5. And this now is the key. This is what I said a minute ago. The vanilla cookie has a higher probability if it's bowl one than if it's bowl two. So that likelihood, seven, the 75%, is higher than 50. And that means that my unnormalized posterior probabilities are different. Now, key part of this, this uh, spreadsheet is that I can add up this column. And what I have down here, the 0.625, that's the total probability of the data under any of my hypotheses. I get that just by adding up the unnormalized posteriors. That's the 5 eighths that I computed in my head a minute ago by waving my hands. This is now the more computational way to do that. Now, if I divide through by that total probability, that's the denominator of Bayes' theorem. When I divide through, that means that my posterior probabilities are now normalized they add up to one, right? Because I took their total, I divided through by the total, so the result has to add up to one. It does, and what it tells me is that the posterior probability of bowl one is 0.6. For bowl two, it's 0.4. And that's, again, that's what we computed. We got uh, the 5 eighths, no, no, the 3 fifths and 2 fifths. Spreadsheet working for people, any technical problems? And any conceptual problems or questions? Do jump in with questions anytime. I probably should have said that earlier. Yeah. All right, so, okay. so let's say there was a third ball, ball three. Yep. So, <laughs> fire would change, maybe we'll call that third. And then we don't have That's a great question. So I cheated a little bit because I didn't want to type a third, a third, a third. Okay. I gave them one, 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 which means that my priors are not, nor, are not normalized. Okay. But because I have to normalize anyway at the end, uh -huh. it doesn't matter. Okay. So it's a bit of a cheat. All right. but, but yes, so please go on and finish your thought. So then, all right, now I think this kind of, okay, so I said like there's a quarter. Um, okay, so that's all you Yes. Yes, and I'm going to repeat a little bit because I think the mic won't pick you up. So you're asking, so what if there's a bowl three, it's got a different likelihood of a vanilla cookie, and you said, and you said yeah, you could have any number of bowls, and they could have all different probabilities of yielding a vanilla cookie. And this is great. If I was going to plant you in the audience and have you ask that question, it would be great. Because that's exactly where we're headed, which is that once you have this idea, you can have any number of hypotheses, and the mechanism is the same. And in fact, what we're going to do soon, in this case, I have three different probabilities of a vanilla cookie, 0.75, 0.5, and 0.25. But let's say I had no idea what the probability was. I could have 100 hypotheses with all the different values of probability from 0 to 100. And I could make a pretty good estimate of the probability of a vanilla cookie, given that I knew nothing about the bowls ahead of time. And that's exactly where we're headed. Great. Other questions or thoughts at this point? Good so far. All right. Let's see, so that's it with the spreadsheet. Let me go back to the slides. You met your neighbor. We filled in the spreadsheet. So here's the version that has fractions in it, but same thing. All right, so the next step, I said we were gonna solve this problem in three ways. The third one, we're gonna use a computational library called empirical distributions. This is, I wrote this library, so it's just kind of a small little thing. Um, it, we're gonna use a class called PMF, which stands for probability mass function. And here's a secret, 
a PMF is actually just a pandas series. So if you know pandas, you know this library already. The only thing, it provides a couple of features that are specific for probability mass functions, but it's basically a map from what are all the possible outcomes to what are their probabilities. So the PMF that you're about to make is going to have an entry for bowl one, an entry for bowl two, and two probabilities in it. That's what that is. And we're going to do it using Jupyter. So I assume many of you have used Jupyter before. I also assume that some of you have not. So if you have used it before, you totally know what you're doing, feel free to ignore me for the next couple of minutes. And I'm just going to walk through how to get set up for people who might not have done that before. So let me, I did this earlier, but I'm going to shut it down. OK. So I have, oh, actually, I'm, I'm even going to conda deactivate. All right. So here I am. I'm in my base Python environment. And I have just downloaded my repository. So either you grabbed a zip file or you git cloned the repository. But either way, you should have a directory called base made simple. And if you cd into that directory, you will see all the material for this workshop. One of the things that you'll see is an environment file. If you have not done this already, you can conda env create from a file, specifically using the environment file, and that will create a new conda environment that has all the requirements you need for this workshop. You don't have to do this. So if you already have a Python environment and you installed the things that I asked you to install, that's totally fine. You don't need to create a new environment. If this is new to you, this is not a terrible idea that when you start a new project, you should create a new environment. And you can use pipenv, you can use conda. If you're using conda, create a new conda environment for that new project, install the things that you need, and it's just a tidier way of working, particularly if you work on several projects. So I have already done that, which means that I have that environment. Since I have it, I can activate base. Yes. Virtual environment of your choice, as long as it's conda. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I have no uh, loyalty to Conda other than my experience has been that it, it just works pretty well. When I run tutorials, if people are using Conda, the experience is usually pretty good. Let me, I'll come around and help, or maybe Matt, Matt is also available to help out. Um, so what this, this prompt is now telling me, on the left, it's telling me that I'm in my Bayes Made Simple environment. And I'm in my Bayes Made Simple directory. And now, if I launch Jupyter Notebook, it will grab my open browser and open a new tab in it and launch me into the Jupyter homepage. So just to show you this, so this is the window where I just launched the Jupyter server. So this is running in the background. It tells me the URL where the server is available. It will also try to launch your browser. And the first notebook that we're going to use is the one that's called 01cookie.ipynb. And again, I know that many of you know this, but if you're new to Jupyter, the key piece of information is that each cell here contains either text, so the first cell is just text, or code. This cell contains all of my import statements. And if you hit shift enter or shift return, it will execute that cell and then move to the next one. So if you execute text, it doesn't do anything. If you execute the code, it ran all my import statements. It didn't produce any error messages, so that tells me that my environment is set up. And now I can start running the code. 
and I'm going to create a PMF object. I'm going to put some values into it and go from there. So we'll take a few minutes once you're done with the setup. And again, Matt and I are going to come around and help. Once you're done with the setup, you're going to read through the first part of the notebook, run the code, and do the first exercise. Do the second exercise. And if you have a little bit of extra time, you can do the bonus exercise. All right, I'm going to come around. Let me know if you need any help. So here's how I'm going to do the exercises. First of all, if you are stuck on an exercise and you're frustrated and unhappy, one of your options is to open the solutions. So there they are, notebook, cookie01solution.ipynb. Same notebook, the only difference is that the solutions are filled in. So feel free to cheat. <coughs> The point here is to learn, not necessarily to solve every exercise. So do whatever works best for you. The other thing, I will run through solutions up here. So if you're stuck, you can watch me and follow along. So part one, I just plotted the um, distribution. This is the distribution of outcomes if you roll two dice. The possible outcomes are the values from 2 to 12. And their probabilities look like that. If you play dice at all, you probably know that seven is more likely because there are several combinations that, that yield seven. And two and 12 are unlikely because there's only one possible combination. And you can work on the second exercise. And I'll work up here. And then I'll interrupt you again in a minute. OK. And here's a partial solution for the second exercise. So you can modify a PMF object. And as I said, it's really just a pandas series. So you can use the bracket operator to say, if I tell you that the result was greater than 3, that means that 2 and 3 are ruled out. So they have probability 0. So I set them to 0. And then I plot the result. And I can compute the mean. This is basically a Bayesian update that I just did. I eliminated two hypotheses. And the result here is kind of the posterior distribution. And the 6.7 is kind of the posterior mean, except not quite. Can someone tell me why not quite? Yeah. Right. I forgot to normalize. So in fact, if I check, I think it's total. Maybe it's sum. There it is. So I had 12 hypotheses. They used to add up to 1. I eliminated two of them. Now they don't add up to 1 again. So the things that I have now are not quite probabilities. They're unnormalized. But twice provides a method called normalize. Now the total is 1, at least to a floating point approximation. And that is, honestly, the posterior distribution. So if you roll two dice and the outcome is greater than 3, then this tells me the posterior mean and the entire posterior distribution. Are you getting the greater How am I getting the greater than 3? It means that the Outcomes 2 and 3 have been eliminated as possibilities. So I've set them to probability 0. Any other questions about the first example and the first exercise? Any eager people go on and do the bonus exercise? If you're interested, come back. You can work on that one later. I think it's kind of a fun exercise. OK. By the way, did the, the plus work for everybody? I was anticipating that there might have been a problem there, but it seems like there was not. Good. No, it's not. OK, that's a good question. So it's not just addition. It is actually convolving the two distributions together to compute the distribution of the sum 
of the values. And it's actually, it's, it's an n squared operation because it's enumerating all the pairs of outcomes. Um, and that's actually why I changed the API. So in the future, that plus operation isn't going to work anymore because I felt like it was misleading. I was hiding too much work behind a simple looking <laughs> operator. So I'm going to, I'm going to, deep down inside it's called convolve and for now it's called add dist. Okay. So just to review, we created a PMF object. We used it to represent possible outcomes and their probabilities. In this case, just a six-sided die. And we saw the methods that we're going to use, which are normalize and mean. We're actually not going to use choice, but if you wanted to do random simulations, this gives you the ability to draw values from a PMF with the appropriate probabilities. And we did the exercises. All right. This now gives us almost everything we need to do Bayesian statistics in a computational framework. We're going to use the PMF object to represent prior probabilities. So what are all the possible hypotheses and what are their priors? And then we're going to compute the likelihood of the data under each hypothesis. And that's the probability of the data given H. Multiply through and then normalize. And remember, normalize just means I'm going to add it all up and divide through by the total. So here's what that looks like using the PMF object. This is the prior. So I've got a PMF that contains two hypotheses. The default behavior is that it's going to give them equal probability. I'm going to do an update like this and a normalize like that. You're going to see this in the notebook. So I, I went through that quickly because you're about to see it. So go back to the notebook, read through the next section of the code, and do exercise three. If you have time, do exercise four. And again, if you are having any problems, questions, call me over or, or grab Matt. <coughs> OK, same deal. If you're making progress and you don't need my help, feel free to ignore me. If you're ready to see a solution, you can follow along. So the premise here is that I drew the first cookie. It was a vanilla cookie, and I did a Bayesian update. So what I now believe, if you look at the top of the screen, that is the posterior after I saw the first cookie. It's 6040. That posterior from the first cookie becomes my prior for the second cookie. So I'm going to do a second update. So I, I put the vanilla, just to keep all the probabilities the same, I put the cookie back, I stir the bowl, but then I draw from the same bowl, turns out to be a chocolate cookie. I'm going to do a second update, and the difference is now my likelihoods are different. The probability of a chocolate cookie from bowl one is 0.25. The probability of a chocolate cookie from bowl two is 0.5. So I'm going to multiply by the likelihoods normalize the distribution, and notice the return value from the normalized function is the denominator of Bayes' theorem. It's the total probability of the data. Most of the time, I don't really care what that is, although it does give me some information that we might talk about later. What I really care about is the posterior distribution, which I can now visualize, and it's telling me that having seen a vanilla cookie and then a chocolate cookie, having done two updates, I now think that the probability of bowl one is about 43% and the probability of bowl two is 57. Question? Yeah, so everything makes sense except where the values 0.25 Good question. The 0.25 and the 0.5, that is the conditional likelihood of the data. One way to think about it is, if someone came to you and told you, I know for sure that it's bowl number one, what's the probability of a chocolate cookie? You'd say, okay, what's the probability of drawing a chocolate cookie if I know that it's bowl one? Well, it's 25% because I know that bowl one contains 25% chocolate cookies. And the second line there, again, it's the conditional probability of the data given the hypothesis. And that's the key to this whole thing. I'm glad you're asking the question, because this is the key. 
It's the conditional probability of the data given the hypothesis. It is if by magic someone told you for sure that it was bowl number two, what would be the chance of getting a chocolate cookie? It would be 50-50 because half of the cookies in bowl two are chocolate. So that's where those likelihoods come from. And the nice thing about this whole framework is that really all you have to do is figure out those likelihoods. If you can do that, Bayes' theorem does the rest of the work. Good. Hopefully this is making more sense. I think I will not do exercise four, but I will just assert that, well, actually, I'll show you the solution from the solutions. You can do this as two different updates. You can take the vanilla cookie, do an update, get a posterior distribution. Use that posterior to do a second update with the chocolate cookie. Or you can do this. You can do both updates at the same time. You can treat one vanilla and one chocolate as if it is a single piece of data and do a single update. And logic suggests that I should get the same result either way. And mathematics supports us. We do get the same result. Either way. Yes, question. Is it any two cookies? It is not any two cookies. So I could, let's, let's start the scenario over from the beginning. And suppose that I drew the vanilla cookie, put it back, stirred, drew another cookie. It was also vanilla. Let's do that update. So in this case, first of all, I haven't run this notebook yet, so I just need to run all the cells. OK. This is the scenario we were just talking about a minute ago. If I do one vanilla, one chocolate, that's my posterior. Let's remember the 43. That's my, my 43. Your question was, what if it had been two vanilla? In that case, this, right, this would be different. That's the second cookie from bowl one. It, that 25 is 25 because it was chocolate. It would be 75 if it were vanilla. Now, let's think about our intuition for a second. Bowl one contains more vanilla cookies. If I draw two vanilla cookies in a row, that's making me think it's looking more and more like bowl one. I'm expecting this posterior probability to be higher than 43%. In fact, I expect it to be higher than 50%. In fact, I expect it to be higher than 60%, because that's kind of where I started. And it is 69%. And I could throw in more. What if I drew three times and got three vanilla cookies? That's that. In that case, I would be up to 77%. Yes? <coughs> yes. Yeah, so your comment is, this is making more sense because you're seeing that the vanilla and chocolate cookies are encoded in those likelihoods. That's how we're plugging in the information that we drew a vanilla or a chocolate cookie. Excellent. That's a really nice way to say it. Okay. <laughs> Are we, yeah, dumb questions, best kind, please. Well, so you're treating those independently. Uh, ah. So you're, you're saying, let's suppose I drew three in a row from the whole one. Yes. But if I drew one and I keep it out, the probability is no longer three quarters when I get the second. I get the second. Right, great question. So you're reminding me. Oh, so it wasn't a dumb question. No, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Right. Did you say that explicitly? I did, but that's totally fine. 
No, it's good. It's good to get. You, you're pointing out an excellent thing, which is the reason that I multiply these probabilities, I'm assuming that they are independent, and they are independent because I threw in a little bit of detail, which says after I draw each cookie, I put it back and I stir. And that's intended to guarantee that they really are. There is another version of this problem in the textbook, if you're interested, which is the one that says, what if I take the cookies out and eat them? Now I have to keep track of the hypothetical state of each bowl as I take cookies out of it. And that's, from, in a computational framework, very doable. You just have a, something like a Python dictionary that keeps track of the contents of the bowl. And each time you draw a cookie, you update it. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit more programming, but conceptually, it's not, well, not hard. Exactly. Right, because each, each time your, your, the conditional probability sure. changes. Each time the conditional probability changes, yeah. correct. All right. Good. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Very good. Okay, we did exercise three. Just to wrap up, part one, we've done Bayes' theorem. We solved the cookie problem three ways. We use the table and we use the PMF class. And when we come back, we are going to start in on the dice problem. Now, here's the deal. We're going to do three notebooks. We'll take a break after each notebook. Let's take 10 minutes and resume at five minutes past 9 o'clock. <coughs> there are snacks in the hallway. And I'll see you at five past. All right, let's get back to it. Second problem we're going to work on is called the dice problem. This is going to sound like a toy problem, but the punchline is that this turns out to be useful. So we'll get there in a minute, but we'll start out with a simple problem. It says, I have a box of dice that has in it a four-sided, six, eight, and 12-sided die. Question. OK, I will fix that after the break. Um, four, six, eight, and 12-sided die. I pull out a die. I don't tell you which one I. Picked, I roll it, and I tell you that I got a six, you have to guess which die it is. Now, intuitively, you would say, okay, probably not the four-sided die. Now, are the others equally likely? They haven't been eliminated, but maybe they're not all equally likely. So start to think about what's the likelihood function? What's the probability of getting a six as a function of the number of sides on the die. Think about it. We will work through it on the spreadsheet. So let's, let me switch over. We can reuse the spreadsheet. And I will write in my hypotheses. Four, six. Is this right? I said 4, 6, 8, and 12? Good. Now, I'm going to use the same trick that I was chastised for earlier. I'm not going to normalize my prior probabilities. They're all equal. They're all 1 quarter. But since I have to normalize at the end anyway, I'm going to leave them unnormalized. Now, let's think about the likelihoods. If I know for sure that it's a four-sided die, what's the probability of getting a six? Zero. That one's easy. If I know for sure that it is a six-sided die, what's the probability of getting a six? One out of six. By the way, don't type one-sixth, because that's a date. That's January 6th. Uh, you can do equals one over six. That'll work. And we can do equals one over eight. And equals 1 over 12. And believe it or not, we're done. The nice thing about Bayes' theorem, if you tell me the priors and you tell me the likelihoods, you're done. The spirit of the good Reverend Thomas Bayes comes from the grave, <laughs> computes, <laughs> computes the unnormalized posteriors, computes the total probability of the data, divides through, and those are the posterior probabilities. 0.444-333-222, which you might recognize as 4 ninths, 3 ninths, and 2 ninths. And that is the dice problem.
So again, just to see how that goes. Now I did in my notes a little bit of a trick here, which is again, taking advantage of the fact that I have to normalize at the end. I'm gonna take that whole column of likelihoods and multiply it by 24. Just because that makes the math easy. And now the total probability of the data is not a probability anymore, but it is nine. I divide through by nine, and those are the posterior probabilities. Now, normally we don't do this using arithmetic on paper. We don't use rational numbers, but just to see how that works. Okay. If you would, jump into the next notebook. Uh, chapter two, or rather uh, notebook two, dice.ipimb. Read, read through the first section and do the first exercise. So again, if you're making progress without me, you can ignore me. If you want to get started, this is what the structure of the solution is going to look like. We're going to take each entry in the PMF, the 4, 6, 8, and 12, multiply them by the likelihood of the data, and then normalize and print the posterior distribution. And I'll get you started, which is that that one is zero. Okay, so this is the solution to exercise one. It looks pretty much like what we did in the spreadsheet. The column of fractions there is the same column that we had. Those are the likelihoods. And then I normalize and print the posterior distribution. One tricky thing here to be a little bit careful of is each time you run this cell, it's going to do an update. So you're gonna get a different value, which means that you have actually not got the wrong answer. You have the right answer to a different question which is, what if I take that same die, roll it again, and I get a six again, then what's the posterior? If I just run this cell again, I will get that. And if I keep rolling sixes, eventually I will become quite convinced that that must be the six-sided die. So after about, maybe I did that eight or nine times, I think there's a 90% chance that it's the six-sided die. Because if it were the eight or 12-sided die, it would be surprising that I had not seen seven or more after so many rolls. Okay. That was part one. Again, here's what that solution looks like. Any questions there? Okay. Now, I'm gonna show you a framework for doing these updates to take advantage of the fact that every Bayesian update basically looks the same. I have my priors, I multiply through by the likelihoods, I normalize, and then I have the posterior. So I'm gonna take that framework and encode it in a function. This is the function. This is a Bayesian update expressed in Python. So self in this case, this is a, a PMF method, so self is the PMF object. Likelihood is the function that computes the likelihoods. And it takes two arguments, data and hypothesis. So you can think of that as being probability of the data given the hypothesis. And it loops through each hypothesis, computes the likelihoods, multiplies, and then normalizes. So this framework is always the same. The only thing that changes is the likelihood function. So one way to solve Bayesian problems is you write the likelihood function and then the good reverend Thomas Bayes comes and does the update. So there, that's the challenge for the next exercise is to write a likelihood function that works for any observed data, not just the six that I rolled, and it works for any hypothetical number of sides on the dice. So that's exercise two. You're gonna fill in this function. Let me just say one more time before you get into it. You're gonna get two arguments. You're gonna get the data, which is an integer that represents the observed result. That's the six that I rolled. And then the hypothesis is going to be the hypothetical number of sides on the die. This function is gonna get called once for each hypothesis. So when this function gets called in this example, 
The data will always be the same and the hypothesis will change, but your job is to write a general function that will work for any data, any hypothesis. Let me make a suggestion for getting started with this. So one, I created some local variables that have names here that are gonna help me remember what's what. So I created observed outcome equals data and number of sides equals hypo, just to help me unpack what those things mean. I've also, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna make this thing return one. So this isn't gonna be correct yet, but I am going to print data and hypo, just so we see how this function works. So that's my temporary likelihood function. Now, when I do the update, I'm gonna get a print statement every time my likelihood function gets called. Remember the left column is the data, the right column is the hypothesis. So the data is always six. And the hypothesis is one of four, six, eight, and 12. And then a question that I just got a minute ago that's an excellent question is, maybe it's an observation, I'm representing the hypotheses using integers. In the first example, I used strings, bowl one, bowl two. In this example, I'm using integers. That's fine. With this framework, I can use any representation I want for the hypotheses, as long as my likelihood function understands my hypotheses, it'll be fine. For this one, I took advantage of integers because I'm gonna wanna do arithmetic with the hypotheses. So let me pause there, give you a, a little bit more to work on the exercise, and then we'll look at a solution. is whether that's good practice, doing arithmetic with addresses. It is, it's, it's a little bit strange. You know, an alternative, I could use strings to represent these hypotheses, and then inside this function, I would, just use, I would just need some logic that would give me a mapping from the name of my hypothesis to what it means as a numerical quantity. And I'm short, I'm, I'm shortcutting that step, but I don't think it's bad practice. I can represent the hypotheses however I want. And again, feel free to ignore me if you're making good progress, but if you'd like a nudge, one way to think about this problem is there are two cases. If the observed outcome is greater than the hypothetical number of sides on the dice, that's one case. And if it's not, that's my other case. Anybody wanna tell me? If the observed outcome is greater than the hypothetical number of sides on the die, what's the probability of that outcome? Zero. And then the last part is to figure this out. So one way to think about this likelihood function is while you are inside this function, you live in a deterministic world. You know for sure that the given hypothesis is true. And you are only asked to compute what would be the probability of the data if I knew for sure. So if I tell you it's a six-sided die, the chance of getting a six is one out of six. If I tell you it's an eight-sided die, it's one out of eight. If I tell you it's a 12, it's one out of 12. And in general, if I tell you the number of sides, one over that number of sides is the probability. So this is the likelihood function. 
Now, this is one of those cases where this is such a good divide and conquer strategy that by the time we actually do the solution, it seems embarrassingly simple, but it actually is. We have solved the dice problem. If that's our likelihood function, that's our posterior. Yes, question. Ah, good question. Okay, so you are observing, first of all, this function, likelihood dice, takes two parameters. And so you, now you're looking for a function call. You're looking for where does my likelihood function get called? And you are looking at this line, which seems very strange, because I'm not actually calling the likelihood function there. I am passing that likelihood function as a parameter to the update function, and the update function is where you will find the function call you are looking for. Oh, it's in the slides. There it is. So inside the update function is where the update function calls your likelihood. And this, if you are not big on functional programming, this probably seems like a strange thing to do, but once you get used to it, it's pretty common. When I call update, I pass my likelihood function as a parameter. The update function calls my likelihood function over and over. Does that help? And one nice thing about this, now that I have update, I can do it over and over. So let's say that I, let's start from the beginning again. I draw a die, I roll it, I get a six. We've done that update. And then I take that same die, I roll it five more times, and I tell you I got eight, seven, seven, five, and four. This is what that update looks like. And what's your intuition now? Probably the eight-sided die. So four has been eliminated, six has been eliminated. It might be eight, it might be 12. If it's the 12-sided die, it's a little bit surprising that I haven't seen a nine or better. How surprising is it? That's what Bayes' theorem is going to tell us. So when I hit enter, it's gonna tell me how sure I should be that it's the eight-sided die. And Four is eliminated, six is eliminated, and 92%. So having rolled the die six times, I am now 92% sure that it's the eight-sided die. Good so far, questions? So, so this is the five times of rolling. Yes. Well, let me double check. This is six times. I did, I did the, the initial six, and then I did five more. All right, so we've got our update function. We've got our likelihood function. We did, the first, did we do the first exercise? Where are we here? Yes, we did exercise two. There's our likelihood function. We got our posteriors, we did more data. Good. Good so far? Now, I promised you that this was not gonna be a totally silly problem. Turns out that this problem saved World War II. Because you have just, unbeknownst to you, solved the German tank problem. So this is, this is real. During World War II, German tanks were given serial numbers. Each factory was given a block of 100 numbers each month. They would start at the beginning, and at the end of the month, any unused numbers would, would, would stay unused, and they would start with the next block. So every time you, you captured a tank, you would take it apart and record the serial numbers on all the parts. Chassis and wheels were the two 
big ones. And by looking at the observed serial numbers, you could estimate how many tanks the Germans had produced in each factory during each month. So here's the scenario. Let's, you know, let's boil it down to a single block. 100 numbers, 1 to 100. You capture a tank that's number 42. What should you believe about how many tanks the Germans produced? Well, at least 42. And for all the numbers from 43 to 100, what is the likelihood of that data? What is your likelihood of capturing that tank? Now, we have to make some assumptions here. Let's pretend that all the tanks are equally likely to be captured and a certain amount of independence. So definitely some modeling errors that we should worry about, but putting those aside for a minute, the actual probability computations are surprisingly straightforward. This is the likelihood function for the tank problem. And it might look familiar. It's exactly the same as the dice problem. So, if you want to jump into, um, oh, wait, hang on, I might be out of sync. I think we need notebook three. Do we, or is it? Not? Oh, oh, well, good, good. Yes, read the next section and do exercise three. I just got a question that I wanted to relay. If you want to look at any of the source code uh, for my library or pretty much any library, uh, Jupyter has a magic command, and that's technically what it's called. They are called magic commands. Percent P source means print the source code, and any method that you can name or any function that you can name should work. Shift enter, it'll pop up a window, and there is the source code. Okay, once again, feel free to ignore me, but let's take a look at a solution. Just make a lot more room. So we saw tank number 42. We are now convinced that the Germans, you know, during that month in that factory made more than 42 tanks. If we now observe tank number 17, it seems at first like we haven't learned anything. Because we already knew they had 42. Telling me that they also have more than 17 doesn't mean much. Except, again, that if they had 100 tanks, it is less likely that I would get tank 17 because I might have got tank 99. So in some sense, the fact that I didn't get tank 99 makes me think that they don't have so many tanks. And Bayes' theorem tells me exactly how to quantify that intuition. So this gray line is what I believed after the first tank. The gray line is the posterior after tank 42. And it says, I know they've got 42 or more, but it's pretty flat, meaning I don't feel very strongly about any of the numbers between 42 and 100. After I capture tank 17, I'm starting to think, you know, I don't think they've got so many tanks. And my, so my posterior is getting steeper near 42 and the probability of the high numbers is going down. So does that make sense intuitively? Does the computation make sense? How's this going? Question? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> you're looking ahead at the slides. <laughs> I'll come back to that in just a second. Other thoughts or questions? Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're taking advantage of some modeling assumptions that they are using the serial numbers in order and, they, and that we are equally likely to capture any tank regardless of its serial number. So definitely some assumptions. Good. All right, so congratulations. You just saved the world from the Axis powers. Um, so this is, this is similar to, this isn't exactly what was actually done during World War II, but it's the same idea. And after the war, the records were captured and we were able to ground truth the estimates. And it turned out that the statistical estimates were pretty good. This is from the Wikipedia page that's about the German tank problem. Take a look if you get a chance. Uh, during these months, the estimates were in the hundreds 
And the actual output was in the hundreds. And the estimates that were coming from conventional intelligence were off by about an order of magnitude. Uh, and that we got a question a minute ago, you know, why is that? I don't really know. Although I will say one of the things that happens is there's a, a bias when you do this kind of estimate. If you are too high, if you overestimate the enemy's power, that your the the cost function is not as much as if you are too low. <laughs> so when estimates go through a sequence of like a chain of command, they tend to get rounded up at every step of the process. There's a very similar process that happens with weather forecasts. Uh, Nate Silver wrote about this in a book. This is one of my recommendations at the end. His book is called The Signal and the Noise. It's about Bayesian statistics. It's very good. I, I recommend it. One of his examples, the National Weather Service is extremely well calibrated. If they say 30% chance of rain, it rains 30% of the times on the occasions when they say 30% rain. That's when it comes from the National Weather Service. If it comes from a national newspaper, they overestimate the probability of rain because they're making people happy. If I tell you that it's going to rain and it doesn't, you're happy. <laughs> if I tell you it's not going to rain, you plan your wedding, it's outdoors, it's going to be beautiful, and it rains, I'm in trouble. And similarly, it, once you get to the point of local television weather forecasts, they strongly overestimate because at every stage of that pipeline, they're overestimating. OK. See where we are. <coughs> In this case, we did, we did not put back the tank and stir, right? <laughs> OK, we did the tank problem. We are going to take our second break. I, I, I like kind of small chunks. As long as we can take relatively short breaks, we'll be good. But let me introduce the problem so you can start thinking about it. So this comes from David Mackay. He has a book that's called Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms. This is the book where I learned about Bayes, Bayesian statistics for the first time. His chapter three is one of the best, really concise introductions I've encountered. This will also be on my list of resources. And I stole this problem from him. This is when the Euro coin first came out. And this is 10 or 12 years ago. I forget more. Somebody helped. I, a while ago. I won't even try to guess. Um, the Belgian coin attracted attention because the face on it was a bit more concave than most. And people speculated that if you spin the coin on edge and wait for it to fall over, it's more likely to land either heads or tails because of its lopsidedness. Somebody did it, spun it 250 times, got 140 heads, and speculated that this was not a fair 50-50 coin. They took it to a, let's say, classical statistician who computed a p-value. If, compu if you're familiar with p-values, that's what that 7% is. It says, if it were a fair coin, the chance of this outcome or a more extreme outcome would be only 7%, and therefore this looks suspicious. And that is, in classical statistics, how you would interpret that data. What we're going to do after the break is interpret this data using a Bayesian framework. So let's come back in 10 at 9.55. So we posed the euro problem. And again, the idea is we have spun the coin on edge 250 times. We got 140 heads. And we would like to know, is this a fair coin, or is it a uh, meaning 50-50, or a biased coin, meaning some other probability of being heads? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to assume that any given coin has some probability of landing heads. And I'm going to call that quantity x. And we're going to estimate that quantity. We're going to estimate it by computing a posterior distribution for x. Now, one of the things that's going to make our heads hurt in a minute is that we're going to compute the probability for each value of x. And x itself is a probability. So these are going to be probabilities of probabilities. And your head will hurt. However, here's one way to reinforce your brain uh, 
case, your brain case, what is it called? Your skull. Um, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> so temporarily, forget that x is a probability. It's just a physical characteristic of a coin. Every coin has a weight and a diameter and some probability of landing heads. And we're going to estimate a physical quantity. So the prior is, what do we believe about the coin before we have spun it at all? And we could think about what that should be. Um, most coins are probably pretty close to 50-50. It would probably be weird for a coin to be you know, 1% or 99%. But at least for now, I'm going to start out uniform. I'm going to start out believing temporarily that all values between 0 and 100 are equally likely. And we're going to come back at the end and rethink that. But we're going to start with simplest possible prior. There it is, flat line. So I don't know what x is, but it could be any value from 0 to 100, and they are all equally likely. Your job is to figure out the likelihood function. And let me just remember one more time. We're going to call update. Update is going to call your function. Each time your function gets called, you will be given a piece of data. What did we observe? And it will be either heads or tails, two strings, h or t. And you'll be given the hypothetical value of x. So your function is going to get called 101 times. And each time it gets called, you will get a number from 0 to 100. If you go to the notebook and fire up 03 euro.ipynb, I'm going to make a suggestion, which is the first thing that you should do to this likelihood function is make a print statement. There's my prior. Now, when I do an update, currently my likelihood function always returns 1. So this update isn't going to have any effect. The posterior will be the same. But I will see my likelihood function getting called over and over. My data on the left is always heads. And the hypothetical values of x go from 0 to 100. And your job is to figure out what goes here. And I'm going to make one suggestion, which is divide through by 100, just to make it into a proper probability. So when I get hypo, I'm going to divide by 100. Let's do that. Think about for that for a few minutes. Ask questions if you have them. Let's think about this a minute. So each time this function gets called, I'm going to be told heads or tails. It'll either be h or t. And I'm told x. And my job is to answer the question, what's the probability of the data given the hypothesis? So if someone tells me the probability of heads is 75% and I got heads, what's the probability of the data given the hypothesis? 75%. In some sense, the question has answered itself. This is one of those cases where it seems so simple, it can't possibly be right, but it's true. What we're being asked is, if the probability of heads is x, what's the probability of heads? <laughs> and the answer is x. If the probability of heads is x, what's the probability of tails? 1 minus x. And that's it. That's the likelihood function. If I run that now, 
There's my prior. There's the posterior. What this says is, if I know nothing about a coin, and anything from zero to one is equally likely, and I flip heads once, the posterior distribution of x looks like that. And what it says is, the probability of zero is now zero. Because I've ruled out a headless coin. And the most likely is that it is a double-headed coin. And everything else is in between. And in fact, the shape of that function is the identity function. It's x. Because when I see heads, I am multiplying through by x. Question? So a high code is just a, a sequence of integers from uh, zero Yeah, hypo is the sequence of integers from one to a, or 0 to 100. Yep. And each time my, my, each time my likelihood function gets called, I get one hypothetical value. So that's what things look like after one heads. What do you think it'll look like with two heads? You can think about this intuitively. Okay, the high values of x are going to be more and more likely. Or you can think about it mathematically, which is I'm multiplying through by x. If I multiply x by x, I get x squared, which is a parabola. So it's parabolic because math. And intuitively, this is saying I am becoming more and more convinced that this is a high probability heads coin. And the low values are getting more and more discounted. But what if I now flip tails? What's that going to do to the shape of this curve? Immediately, the x equals 1 or x equals 100, I think I'm being inconsistent there, but I hope you know what I mean. That end of the curve has to come down to 0. And mathematically, what's the shape of this curve now going to be? It's x times x times 1 minus x, which is a cubic curve that looks like that. So the extremes have been eliminated. Where is the peak of that curve? I'm starting to think this coin is somewhere in the middle, but I'm leaning a little bit toward the high values. The peak of that is at 2 thirds which is the observed ratio of heads. I've seen two-thirds heads, and my peak estimate is two-thirds. The notebook will take you through the next couple of steps, 10 spins, and then the full data set. So let me give you a minute to work through that, and let me just see where we're going to stop the next section. Yes. So read through the next section and stop when you get to swamping the prior. I want to draw your attention to two steps in this process. The first one here, this is what we believe after seeing 10 flips. So let's, and this is just making up the data, but pretend that we spun it 10 times and we got seven heads. This is the posterior distribution. What it's saying is, I think the value of x is probably 20 or more. Most of the values from 20 on down are close to 0. The peak of this distribution is at 70%. Again, that's the observed probability. And the width of the distribution is telling me how uncertain I should be about x. And this is pretty wide. Still, this is saying yeah, anything between about 40 and 90 is still, you know, reasonably likely. As I get more and more data, the width of the distribution gets narrower, and what that represents is my increasing certainty about what x is. So this is what it looks like if I only spin the coin 10 times, and 
This is what it looks like if I spin the coin 250 times. It's much narrower. And that's telling me that I am reasonably confident that the value of x falls between 45 and 65. So that's two things that Bayes does for you. One is it gives you an estimate of what you think x is, and it tells you how confident you should be about that estimate. Okay. So one of the nice things, this whole distribution contains information. The distribution tells you for every possible value of x, what is the likelihood, the probability of that value. And that lets you answer lots of questions. If you want to know the mean, you can compute the mean. If you want to compute an interval that has a 90% chance of containing the true value, you can do that. More generally, if there's a cost function associated with being wrong, you can compute your expected cost by looping through all the possible values, computing their probabilities and their costs, and make decisions. So the whole distribution contains information. However, sometimes you want to summarize it. And there are a few ways to do that. So one is to just compute the mean. And this is just the weighted sum of the possible outcomes. In fact, if you want to take a look, let's do the percent p source. PMF is the name of the class. Mean is the name of the method. <coughs> And you can see the source code. All I've done is taken the p's and the q's, which are the probabilities and the quantities, and multiplied them together and added them up. So it's a weighted sum. And there are a couple of notes there, which is that this only works if the quantities are numeric and if your PMF is normalized. And if I were a better software engineer, this function would throw errors when you violate those assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> it is. If you want to send me a PR, I'd be happy. Um, the other summary statistic that we also often want to pull out is called the MAP, which is the maximum a posteriori probability. A posteriori means the posterior. After I saw the data, what is the, max, what is the value that has the maximum probability? And in this case, it's 56. It says, having seen this data, if you ask me to make my best guess about x, I would say 56. In this case, the mean and the MAP are very close to each other. If you are familiar with classical statistics, the MAP in this case is the same as the maximum likelihood estimator. I also might be interested in the median or other percentiles. So I can pull that out. The median is also 56. And this now gets us to the credible interval. The credible interval is an interval that has a 90% chance of containing the true value. If you have studied classical statistics, this is the point where your eye starts to twitch. <laughs> because every time you said something like that in a statistics class, you got hit with a ruler. Because in a classical statistics, you compute a confidence interval, and you are not allowed to say that there's a 90% chance that the true value falls in a confidence interval. Because in classical statistics, that's not true. In Bayesian statistics, the credible interval means exactly what you want it to mean. It is a sensible, useful <laughs> quantity that we can explain very simply. There is a 90% chance that the true value of x falls in that interval, period. OK, now with some qualifiers. Um, <laughs> assuming that my prior is correct and assuming that my likelihood model is correct. So if all of my assumptions are true, then my credible interval behaves the way I want it to behave. Okay. However, let's get back to that prior. So remember what our prior was. We said that any value between 0 and 100 is equally likely, but that does not take into account the actual background information that we have about coins. Just by living in the world and interacting with coins, we have information. 
And Bayesian statistics gives us both the opportunity and the requirement to bring background information to the problem. So you know what coins look like. You know that if you spin them on edge, they probably don't land heads 99% of the time. Values near 50 are much more likely than values at the extremes. And we can bring that information in by choosing a different prior. So the example I'm going to suggest is a triangle-shaped prior that looks like that. And this is just a mathematical way to represent our intuition that the values near 50 are more likely than the extremes. The next section of the notebook, run through that and we'll see what the difference is between those two priors. And there's an exercise. Okay, so here's a solution. This is mostly I've just cut and pasted pieces. I do the update. I've got two different priors, one that's uniform and one that is triangle shaped. And there are the posterior distributions. And they are not very different, which is good news. What this means is you could imagine two different people having a fight. And one of them is saying, no, 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 I think the prior should be uniform. And the other is, no, you're an idiot. It should be a triangle. And someone else, it's a parabola. It's a, you know, it doesn't matter. The nice thing here is because we have a pretty good amount of data, people who start with very different priors are going to end up with posterior distributions that look pretty similar. Now, mathematically, they're not the same, and they never will be. But at some point, they get close enough that for practical purposes, we don't care anymore, and we can resolve the fist fight and say, look, it's close enough. And that is called swamping the priors. The idea is that the data as a force is so strong that it overwhelms the priors. So even people who disagree about the prior will more or less agree for practical purposes about the posterior. Yeah? then what's the point of setting the priors? The reason is it's not always true. If you don't have enough data, you won't get convergence. And the nice thing there is that the non-convergence tells you how confident you should be. It's telling you, hey, you know, actually reasonable people could, could still disagree. So you get, you get useful information either way. If you get convergence, that means, you know, we have enough data to settle the fight. If you don't get convergence, you can say, you know, we need more data because reasonable people could still disagree. Yeah? How do you know if you have enough? Convergence depends on practical arguments. How big is the difference? If the difference gets to be so small that, that in your domain, you know it doesn't matter anymore. Or those two people could say, look, okay, you know, we're still off by 5%, but hey, you know, I can live with 5%. It, de it depends on the domain. Sometimes 5% is enough. Sometimes 5% means the bridges fall down. So. However, there's a caveat on this, which is if you start with probability zero, you will always have probability zero. Now, intuitively, that makes sense. If you think that something is absolutely impossible, no amount of data will change your mind. And mathematically, remember that we're always multiplying. So if you start with zero and multiply by anything, you get zero. So Cromwell's rule in the world of Bayesian statistics is the idea that you should avoid assigning a probability, to, uh, a probability of zero to anything. You should always leave open the possibility that you might be wrong. And this comes from an impassioned speech that Cromwell made to Parliament, think it possible that you may be mistaken. You can give something an arbitrarily small prior. Eventually, the data will change your mind. All right. That is the Euro problem. What we have done, sneakily, is estimated proportions. So any problem now that involves estimating a probability or a proportion, this is the framework for solving that. Let me just see what's coming up. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose the next problem, 
And then we're going to take one more break because they take our food away at 10.30. <laughs> so we're going, to get, we're going to get out there. So now let me pose this problem. Suppose that you have a row of slot machines and you believe that each machine has a different probability of yielding a win, a positive outcome of some kind. Every time you play a machine, you either win or lose, and you can do a Bayesian update for that machine. But you also have to decide which machine to play. So at any point in time, there might be a machine that you have played several times, and you think it's a pretty good machine. But there's another machine that you haven't played yet, and there's some chance that it's even better. So which should you do? Play the one that's well known or explore. This, so this is an exploit, the thing you already know, versus explore, the things you don't know. Again, this seems like kind of a silly problem. If you're not a gambler, you don't care. But this is a model for A-B testing of any kind. So if you show an ad and someone either clicks or doesn't, or more interestingly, medical diagnosis or medical prescription. So every time you see a patient, you could give them a well-known treatment that has a known probability of working or a newer treatment that we might be more uncertain about. Which one should you try? My favorite example of this, if you've read Fire and Blood, there is a disease, an epidemic, that swept through the population called the shivers. And the, the maesters, who are the doctors in this, in this world, don't know what to do, but they have a number of different treatments. So you could try poultices, hot mustards, and dragon peppers. Um, the other options, let's see, the wall of fire is very popular. That one sometimes works. Um, <laughs> So think about this scenario. The next patient comes into your office, and the question is, should you try the raw fish or the wall of fire? Um, and we will come back in 10 minutes, and we will answer this question. Ah, you've caught me. <laughs> I, I never answered the original question. So this is a part of the answer, which is that I have estimated x, and I can answer any questions that you want about x, including the possibility that it's 50-50. However, the question of whether it's a fair or not fair coin takes a little bit more work to answer, and I have sidestepped it. The reason is that the fair hypothesis is fully specified. Fair means 50-50. The unfair hypothesis is not yet sufficiently specified to answer the question. If you think it's an unfair coin, you have to tell me what you mean by unfair. And we can do that. That is in the book. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that one off for now. But thank you for catching me. All right. Anybody Game of Thrones fans? <laughs> Used to be, Un until season eight. <laughs> yeah, maybe the books will be better. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna play a game that involves every time I play a slot machine, I learn more about that slot machine, and then I have to make a decision about which machine to play next. But the update part of this is the same as what we saw before. So again, if I play one machine, I play 10 times and I only win once, I can do the same Bayesian update and get the posterior distribution for x. And that's the first exercise in the notebook. So if you go to 04, bandit, and then stop when you get to the multiple bandits part. So this shouldn't be too surprising. This is exactly the same as the euro problem. I changed the data so that it's W and L instead of H and T, but other than that, it's the same likelihood function. If I play a slot machine 10 times and I win once, I should believe that the probability of a payout is about 1 out of 10, and that is the peak of this distribution. But the whole distribution tells me how certain I should be, and this is saying I still think there is some chance that this machine has a 40% payoff. So that's part one. 
Any questions so far? Okay, again, this is familiar so far. There's the likelihood. There's the posterior. On to the next section and exercise two. By the way, you are always welcome to do what I just did, which is to open up the solution notebook. I think it's good to think about this stuff, but don't get frustrated. And I'm also aware that four hours is a long time to be focused and make progress. So if you feel stuck, feel free to either look at the solutions and then see if you can recreate it, or copy and paste. So here's what that looks like. This is kind of like doing a scientific experiment that says, if what I want to do is learn about these machines, then I should play them all 10 times or however many times I can afford. And this maximizes my knowledge about the machines. And it means that I have the same amount of information about each machine. Now, in reality, we don't know this, but the reality is that the payoffs are 10, 20, 30, and 40. So remember that, 10, 20, 30, 40. After we play each machine 10 times, this is what we believe about them. And sure enough, the posterior distribution for the first machine is way off on the left. That's the 10% machine. And machine number three is out toward the right. That's the 40% machine. So this is good. This is telling me that my estimates are accurate. <laughs> And the distributions are wide, which means that I am still uncertain about these machines. But I can look at the posterior means, and they are 16, 25, 33, and 41. And remember that the actual answers are 10, 20, 30, 40. So I'm doing OK. I'm learning about the machines. And if I play each of them 100 times, Actually, it's 110 now. My posterior means are 12, 20, 32, and 40. Wow, this is great. I have a really precise estimate of how good each machine is. But that's probably not the goal. My goal is to win, or in the case of patients, not kill people. I'm trying to save lives. And you can imagine having a conversation with a patient and you prescribe machine zero, and they say, well, uh, you know, how good is treatment zero? You know, the wall of fire. So the patient has the shivers, you prescribe the wall of fire, and they say, well, is the wall of fire a good treatment? You can say, well, it has a 10% chance of succeeding, and the patient says, well, wait, I want machine three, and you say, no, 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 this is a controlled experiment. <laughs> I'm giving you machine zero because I want to know more about machine zero. <laughs> Obviously, that would not be the best standard of care. So what we really care about is a strategy that allows us simultaneously to learn which treatment is the best, but also to give the best treatment to each patient, given the knowledge that we have at that time. And that is what the Bayesian strategy does. So again. This is option number one. Option number one says, use all the machines, and then choose the one that's the best. And the problem is that you're killing patients in the meantime. Another one is, you know, play all the machines until we know for sure which one is the best, and then prescribe that. Again, killing too many patients. The alternative is what's called Thompson sampling. And the idea is that for each patient, I'm going to choose a treatment at random with probabilities based on my current beliefs. So the machine that I think is the best has the highest chance of getting chosen. A machine that I think is not the best will have a lower probability, but not quite zero. And a machine that I am still uncertain about will tend to get chosen so that I can learn more about it. The way, so the way this works, when I start out, I don't know anything about any of the machines, so they're all equally likely. As a winner emerges, I gradually choose it more and more, 
And in the long run, I will eventually converge to always choosing the machine that is in fact the best with high probability. Okay. Now, how do I actually do the choice? Remember, at any point in time, I have distributions that look like this. I am uncertain about which machine is the best. So one possibility is to compute the probability of superiority for each machine and then choose with those probabilities. Just from a computational point of view, it's a little bit complicated and it turns out that there's a simpler thing to do, which is I'm going to draw a value at random from each of these distributions and then pick whichever one is the highest. And it turns out that that has the probabilistic behavior I want. So let me send you back to the notebook and do the next section and exercise three. So this is my choose function. This does what I described a minute ago, which is it takes each posterior distribution and chooses a random value from that posterior. And then it uses argmax to find the machine that yielded the highest value. So if I do this over and over with the same set of beliefs, I'll get different values each time. So sometimes I play machine three, sometimes I play machine two. Very occasionally I'll play zero and one, but in, on, in the long run, the better the machine is, the more often I will play it. Now I can plug in all the pieces of this, which is my general strategy says, each time a new patient comes to my office, I'm gonna randomly choose a treatment, not equally random, but this weighted system that I just described, play the slot machine, meaning prescribe to that patient, see what the outcome is, and then update my beliefs based on that outcome. So that's what this function does. It's the choose, play, update, loop. <clears throat> yes? Um, the I here, what are you hoping, or what, what is it supposed to Oh, that's, that would be an error. <laughs> what is that printing? Oh, it should be machine. Thank you for catching that. Yes, the intent is to print which machine did you choose, what was the outcome that you got, and then, having seen that outcome, what is your posterior belief about that machine? So here's one step. I chose machine two, I lost, and now I think that the mean posterior probability for machine two is 28, 29%. So now, I'm gonna, the next section, I'm gonna start over with fresh machines. So I don't know anything about any of them. And if I plot. So we're back to uniform distributions. It's the beginning of time. I've never tried any of these treatments before. And I've initialized a counter. A uh, counter is a data structure. It's in the, col it's in the collect collections module. I'm just going to use it to keep track of how many times I play each machine. So I'm going to run 100 iterations. Each iteration, I'm going to do the choose play update. And at the end, Here's what I believe about the machines. Now notice a couple of things. First of all, my estimates are reasonably accurate in the sense that the actual value falls in these intervals. But also notice that I know the most about machine three and the least about machine zero. And that's actually a good thing because it means that I played machine three more often than I played machine zero, which is good because in actual fact, machine three is better. And that's what the counter is gonna tell us. 
I treated 100 patients. I successfully gave the best treatment to 62 of them, despite the fact that I started with no knowledge about any of them. And I only gave the worst treatment to six of them. Which, when you consider how little I knew at the beginning, is remarkably effective. Now, if you run this over and over, you'll get different values, and you'll see that occasionally you get unlucky. So if I give treatment zero to the first three patients, and coincidentally, all three of them survive, chances are I'm going to give that treatment to those two patients for a long time before eventually the data will correct me. In the long run, I will get corrected, but it is possible that I will make bad decisions in the meantime. But this is about the best I can do. Yeah? Is there any sort of intuition on how much sampling you need to do to prevent that sort of error? Is there any intuition on how much sampling I need to do to prevent that sort of error? Um, no. <laughs> no, it is. So in the short run, you can honestly say, I am making the best decision for this patient based on the information that I have. And in the long run, you can say, with very high probability, I will eventually learn which machine is the best and prescribe it. But you could be wrong for a long time, probabilistically. Yes, right. So yes, in the worst case, it is probabilistically possible that I could give the worst treatment to all 100 patients. Um, but here's another example. I just did a kernel restart and ran again, just to see how it went. And the outcome is similar. I gave 68% the right treatment. Um, in this case, I gave out machines. The, you know, I guess this is the, the wall of fire and the snake venom a little too often. But the pulstices did pretty well. Actually, machine three is probably do nothing. <laughs> Let's see. Any other questions about, yes, Bayesian bandits? At the beginning, you talked about Bayesian A-B testing mm -hmm. and ads example. Could yeah. Just, could you relate this exercise to kind of like A-B testing and ads? I'm just trying to wrap it up. Yeah, sure. The question is about, I mentioned A-B testing with ads as one of the applications. So it would be very similar. If you want to have more than two, you can have as many as you want. So you could have a pool of different versions of an ad. And every time a customer comes to your site, you could choose at random which ad to show using the sampling strategy. And then depending on whether they click on it or not, you would do your update, repeat. Right. Good question. So the question is, how do you balance getting more information with picking the best one? And that is what this strategy is trying to do. I haven't proved that it's optimal, but under certain definitions of the cost function, it is optimal in the sense of probabilistically maximizing the number of patients who get the best treatment. Um, which has the consequence that you often see posteriors that look like this, which is that some of the machines you don't know very much about, which from a scientific point of view makes you uncomfortable. You're like, but, but machine zero might still be the best. Shouldn't I play it more? And the answer is you have to balance your thirst for knowledge with the best treatment for the patient. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, I can't. We can't leave this. We can't leave this to humans. We have to have a machine do it. Well, yes and no. So, a lot of the way we think. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, a lot of the way people think, we are intuitive Bayesians, at least heuristically. The way people think when we get new data, we do updates, and we don't literally do the math, but 
Under certain circumstances, we are pretty good Bayesians. There are other cases where we consistently make errors. Um, but by and large, people are OK. That's my conclusion. All right. I think that's it for the Bayesian. All right. Bayesian bandit problem, Thompson sampling, exploration, and exploitation. We've done it. We have one more. Let me pose our last problem. So this is the World Cup problem. 2018 FIFA World Cup final. I did not have a chance to update this <laughs> example based on the recent outcome. So this is the men's final. Uh, France defeated Croatia 4-2. Question is, based on this outcome, how confident should we be that France is the better team? And if the same two teams had played again, if it was a best two out of three series, what's the chance that Croatia would have won the rematch? And we are going to compute these probabilities. So we have to make some modeling assumptions. And one of them is that goal scoring is a Poisson process which is a statistical model that says that during any minute of a soccer game, there is an equal probability that a given team will score against another team. And it's a, it's a, it's a modeling assumption. It's a simplification. But this is an actual paper where people examined scoring in real games and found, you know, it's a pretty good model. So that's the assumption we're going to make. We're going to say that the events, goals, are equally likely to occur at any given minute during a game. And I'm saying this like from the beginning of the game. What's the probability that they'll score during minute 37 versus during minute 52? And I'm asserting that those are equal. Each team has a certain rate that they will score against another team. So obviously, a good team against a bad team, it's higher, and vice versa. But each team has a rate lambda that is measured in events per unit time, which is goals per game. And what that means, this is the mathematical con consequence, the under, the beige, un under the Poisson model, the time between events follows an exponential distribution. And the number of events in a given interval, in a given time interval, follows a Poisson distribution. I'm going to explain what all of those things mean. But that's a consequence of our modeling decision. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the outcome of the game, 4 to 2, in order to estimate the values of lambda for the two teams. And then we're going to use the posterior distribution of lambda to answer the questions. That is the plan. So how do we think about this? This is good. You guys have you've been Bayesians for three hours and five minutes now. <laughs> so we can start to think about this framework. You're, you're thinking about a new problem. When you go home, you're going to think about your domain. You've got problems, and you want to think about them from a Bayesian point of view. Here's your checklist. What are the parameters? What am I trying to estimate? What's the quantity that I want to know? What are the hypotheses? What are the possible values for those parameters? What's the prior? What do I know about soccer before I see the outcome of the game? And what's the likelihood function? If somebody tells me the hypothetical parameters, can I compute the probability of the data? If you can answer these questions, you can solve a Bayesian problem. So let me stop there. We will take our last break for just seven minutes, because we need to move along here. Seven minutes, we'll come back at 14 minutes past the hour. Think about these questions. All right, let's get back to it. Just for fun, I want you all to write down your prediction. What's your number on this? So two soccer teams have played each other, and one of them won four to two. First of all, what do you think is the probability that the winner is actually the better team? And if they played again, what do you think is the probability that the winner would win again? To so write down those two numbers, and then we'll answer the question. So let me answer what I posed before the break. So the parameter, again, we're going to say there's this rate in goals per game that each team has against the other team. So I'm going to estimate two independent values of lambda. 
What are the hypotheses? Well, what are the possible ranges for lambda? Could be zero. This team will never score against the other team. And that could be like the two professional soccer players against the 100 fourth graders. I don't know if you've seen this video. It's fantastic. But I'm going to say the 100 fourth graders are never going to score. So zero. It could, it could be high. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20. You know, best team in the world. Let's, let's limit ourselves to you know, national soccer teams. Best team in the world versus another. I mean, when, when, is, a soccer, when is one team ever going to score 13 goals against another team? I mean, that, that's just mean. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's the range of values for lambda. Now, uh, for the prior, I'm going to use a gamma distribution just because it has the right shape. But it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a distribution that has a name. It could just, I could just plug in a bunch of different values. So don't get, don't get put off by the gamma distribution. And then the likelihood function is a consequence of what I said before, which is if it's Poisson, the number of goals that are scored during a given interval, let's say one game, the distribution is the Poisson distribution. And that is going to give me my likelihood function in a way that will become clear in a second. So I, I said this a second ago, I'm choosing gamma because it has the right shape. And I'm going to choose the mean by looking at the long-term average number of goals per game in World Cup play, which is 1.4. And that's for each team. So each team scores 1.4 goals on average. And I'm going to use some SciPy stuff to construct the prior. So this is a little bit of SciPy magic. If you're familiar with this, great. If not, don't worry about the details of this. This is just me constructing a distribution that looks like that and that has the right mean. So the mean is close to 1.4. And the shape of it says it's got to be positive valued and it might be as high as 6. I truncated this at 6. We can come back later and see whether we like that prior. It's not going to matter very much. So there's my prior. Now, the likelihood function, if it is a Poisson distribution with the rate parameter lambda, then the probability of k events during one game is given by that expression, e to the minus lambda, lambda the, to the k, and then in the denominator there, that's not k, that's k factorial. Okay. And that is, the, that is the Poisson distribution. It's a discrete distribution that tells me, if I know what lambda is, what's the chance of getting k goals? And that's my likelihood function. Your job is to fill it in. So open up 05 World Cup. And write that likelihood function. By the way, I went to all Python 3 on this. My Greek letters are really Greek letters. And that is my likelihood function. That tells me for a given number of goals scored, what's the probability? Nope, sorry, I said it backwards. For a given goal scoring rate lambda, what is the probability of scoring k goals? That answers that. And then the update function is the same. Now I'm going to do separate updates for France versus Croatia and Croatia versus France. So having seen four goals, and that's where this is. This is my update with four goals. The posterior distribution looks like that. And it is shifted to the right somewhat. Remember that the prior mean was 1.4. Having seen them score four goals, the posterior mean is 2.6. However, notice how wide this distribution is. And what that says is, on the basis of one game, I cannot draw any strong conclusion about lambda. It might be 0.5, it might be 6. And similarly with Croatia, having seen one game, they scored two goals. I'm still quite uncertain about what their lambda is. It's lower, though. Remember, it started as 1.4. They scored two goals. 
Now it's 1.7. So it went up a little, but not as much as France went up. Questions on the update? This one is a little bit trickier because we had to throw some mathematics to compute the likelihood function. I can do it like this using um, mathematical expressions, or I can take advantage of the scipy.stats package. It provides the Poisson distribution, and I can evaluate the PMF of that distribution at k, given the parameter lambda. That is that. Okay, and I cheated a little bit. I went ahead and ran the update. So I'll, I'll give you a minute to do that, and it'll look like this. And then when you're done, you can go on to section three. You can ignore me if you're making good progress. You can pay attention if you want to. So I have these posterior distributions, and I want to compare them. One way to do that is to just draw a random sample from each one. And you can think of these as like alternative universes. Like, I don't know how good France is, but I'm going to choose a value from the posterior distribution, and that'll be one alternative universe where that is actually how good France is. And similarly, I'm going to draw a sample from Croatia. Each of these samples is a thousand alternative universes long, and I'm going to compare them all element-wise. So if you do sample France greater than sample Croatia, you'll get an array of a thousand Boolean values. Here's a universe where France is better. Here's a universe where Croatia is better. And of those thousand universes, I'm going to count how many Croatia is better and how many France is. One way to do that is by computing the NP dot sum of my Boolean array. That'll be the total number of true elements in my Boolean array, and that says that 759 times out of 1,000, France is actually better in this hypothetical universe. So I simulated 1,000 universes, and France is better in 75% of them. If you run it again, you're going to get values that are a little bit different because I've got random sampling in here, but it should be close. Sorry, say again. Oh, np.sum was the hint. Oh, np.mean, yeah. Right, and if, if you want the percentage rather than the number, you can use np.mean. That is the average number of true values in your Boolean array. Okay. Now, that is the probability of superiority. That's the chance that France is actually the better team in this sense of goal scoring rate. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to win 100% of the time. So the next question is, if they play again, who's going to win? Now I need a two-step process. Let me pause for a second. This, this is my solution to exercise three. Let me just pause and see if there are questions on that. And I'm going to go on to the next one. Yeah. This is just assuming the four goal rate and the two goal rate theoretically had two of the same teams, one score four goals, the other score two, this would be no other information on France information. Correct. Yes, let me paraphrase that. You asked, the only information I'm using here is four goals versus two in the first game. I'm not using any other information about France and Croatia. So any two teams that had played and yielded the same outcome, I would make the same predictions. Correct. Okay. Now, to predict the rematch, I have two sources of uncertainty that I need to take into account. One is that I don't really know what the lambdas are. The distributions are still quite wide. And second of all, even if I know lambda, let's say it's three, your goal scoring rate is exactly three, and I know it deterministically, still does not tell me how many goals you will score in the next game. You might score a lot or not very many. However, I can do the same thing and use random simulation to solve this which is, I can choose my random sample the same as I did. So sample France 
is a sample of all the alternative universes where France has different goal scoring rates. In each of those universes, simultaneously, I'm going to simulate a game. And I'm going to sample how many goals they score. Well, we've kind of already answered that question, which is we know for each value of lambda what the distribution of goals is. It's the Poisson distribution. And np.random.poisson will draw a random sample from the Poisson distribution with the given values of lambda. Now, after three and a half hours, when I say a sentence like that, I know it's not going to make a lot of sense. <laughs> Go back to the notebook, run through the code, read it, run it, ask me questions. We're getting there. Hang in there. OK, let me talk you through a couple of things here. This, that uh, cell right there that says sample France and goals France, that's the key. If you understand that cell, you understand the whole thing. The first line says France.choice. France, remember, is the posterior distribution for lambda. So France.choice is a random sample from all the different universes, and the result is an array of lambdas. Sample France is an array of lambdas. I'm going to pass sample France to random Poisson. What that's going to do is it's going to draw a value from a Poisson distribution with each different value of lambda. So it's like playing a simulated game in a thousand parallel universes. And the result is going to be an array of goals scored. So goals France is an array of integers. Sample France is continuous values of lambda. Goals France is discrete values of k, goals scored. And if I pl plot that distribution, I'm plotting it as a bar to show that it is discrete. Because you can't score 1.5 goals. So each outcome is an integer number of goals. Now, there's a decent chance that France would be shot out. The most likely outcome is that they score two goals. Now, that might be a little bit surprising. Right? They scored four in the last game. Why am I predicting that they'll only score two in the next game? Because of the prior. I started out knowing that in World Cup play, the average number of goals is 1.4. So when I saw four, I upgraded my estimate. But I didn't go all the way to four, because I haven't really seen that much data. What I'm really considering here are two hypotheses. Either France has a really high goal scoring rate, or they had a particularly good game. And my belief balances those two possibilities in proportion to my prior and how much data I have. So having seen one game, my prediction for the next game is that this is how many goals France will score. If I do exactly the same update for Croatia, they only scored two. So my estimate for lambda is lower. And on average, not on average, this is the whole distribution. This is the number of goals I think they'll score in the next game. And the peak is at one. And their probability of being shot out is higher. And now we have to do the last exercise of the day. If you have any functioning brain cells left, all we have to do is count up how many of these simulated games France wins. It's a one-liner, and it involves np.mean. Yes. OK, let me go over a solution. And then I had a couple of questions that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. So one. We have simulated 1,000 games, and all I'm doing is counting wins, losses, and ties. And it turns out that Croatia would win 26. Uh, France would outright win 58%. And they would be tied at the end of regulation uh, at 1.5. Now, World Cup final, what do they do? Do they just keep playing? Do they play overtime, sudden death? I don't even know. OK. Two 15-minute halves and then penalty kicks. Got it. Got it. OK. Ah, golden goal, sudden death, same thing. <laughs>
right. But they don't do that. Okay. So that is the answer to the question. If we assume that the ties go roughly 50-50, we would say that Croatia has about a 33% chance of winning a rematch. Now remember, we are 75% sure that France is the better team. So in the long run, they will win 75% of the time. But in a single game, they only win 66% of the time. And that makes sense. That is the answer to the World Cup question. With the information that we used, and this is getting back to, I only used the outcome of one game. If I had gone back into the tournament, maybe I could have seen total goals scored by each team. I could use more data. I could build a more complex model. So this is the correct answer under a very simple model. Okay. Now, I got another question, which was about Monte Carlo simulation. And there are two things I want to say. So one is, what we've done here is a kind of Monte Carlo simulation, which is, after I computed the posterior distributions, I used random sampling to make predictions. So that was a Monte Carlo method. Mathematically, I am sort of integrating the posterior distribution, and except that I did it by simulation rather than mathematically integrating. The other thing that you might have heard about is MCMC, the Monte Carlo Markov chain. That is something else. That is a different way to compute the posterior probability. So let me make a confession. Everything we've done so far is called a grid algorithm because we took a continuous thing like lambda, we broke it up into a discrete grid, and then we did discrete updates with those hypotheses. MCMC is a different way to compute posterior distributions. It does not discretize things. It sticks with a continuous universe. Uh, and if you go on and do the afternoon Bayesian tutorial, you will learn about MCMC. So, okay. This turns out to be useful for a lot of things other than betting on soccer. Many systems in the world behave like Poisson processes. If you have events of interest that occur at a certain rate that can be characterized as a rate of events per unit time, if that rate is a constant, then you have a Poisson process. If that rate varies over time, you can model it as Poisson processes with time varying parameters. So this is a, a general model for solving problems like this. Again, when you encounter problems in your own domains, you can think of this as the checklist. What is my system? How do I quantify it? What are the hypotheses? And what is the likelihood model? What's the probability of my data if I knew what those parameters were? If you can answer these questions, you can do Bayesian methods. So let's see, we did estimating proportions. We did it with the cookie, we did it with the euro, we did it with the Bayesian bandits. So any problem that you encounter where you're trying to estimate a probability, like polling, for example, if you're doing political polling, another example of estimating proportions. We did estimating counts or numbers, how many dice, how many sides are there on a die, how many tanks do the Germans have, and we did estimating rates. How often do things happen? What rate do they occur? I want to give you a little bit of a big picture of where this tutorial fits in, and then some resources that I'll point you to. I actually kind of just said the big picture. If you pick up a Bayesian book, what you will quickly encounter is a fair amount of mathematics and a lot of continuous distributions and multidimensional integrals and numerical methods like MCMC, Monte Carlo Markov chain. It can be hard to get started and hard to get a grip on what's going on. So my intention with this tutorial, by starting with grid algorithms, I hope you've got a good intuition for where this is coming from. How do you get from Bayes' theorem to solving reasonably complicated things like the, the um, World Cup? problem that we did. You can use this same strategy if you work on problems. Start out with a grid algorithm. It's a good way to think about your models, make sure that your model makes sense, test things out. The 
bad thing about grid algorithms is that they are not computationally efficient. But very often, for real world problems, you can solve it. Everything that we ran today ran pretty fast. If it's good enough, stop. If it's not, you can optimize things. You can use numerical methods. And the nice thing is that you now have a reference implementation that you can compare to. So a couple of resources. Uh, some of them are mine. Some of them are things I, I recommend. Uh, the, the, the primary one, uh, almost everything that we did today is in ThinkBase which is available free from thinkbase.com if you want to just grab the PDF. If you would like to have a paper copy of it, the nice people at O'Reilly Media can solve that problem for you. You might also like ThinkStats, which is about exploratory data analysis. It's not particularly Bayesian, but it is about the practical steps that you go through when you are working with a data set to understand what it's about and start to answer questions and guide decision making. Also available free, also from O'Reilly Media. Have to give credit to David Mackay. I took the Euro problem from him. I took it from his chapter three, which I mentioned. His PDF is also freely available. So if you want to read his book, I think it's really great. It also makes the connection between Bayesian statistics and information theory. If you don't know information theory, it will make your brain better to learn about it. It's just a great topic, so I recommend that book. Uh, Cameron Davidson Pilon has a book that's called Bayesian Methods for Hackers. It is on GitHub. The entire book is in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. And it is a nice introduction to MCMC. So if you're not doing the afternoon tutorial, this would be a good place to go next. In fact, I think he has a solution to the World Cup problem using MCMC. So you could see the two solutions side by side. If you are an R person, you're in the wrong conference, but, <laughs> uh, but I do recommend Krushke's book called Doing Bayesian Analysis. It's called The Dog Book for obvious reasons. Really nice job of, of introducing both grid algorithms and MCMC. It uses R, but you know, don't hold that against him. I think he's working on a Python version. Another good book, uh, Richard McElreath, um, Statistical Rethinking, also based in R. I think he's also working on a Python version. I think his discussion of modeling is a really nice feature of this book. And it applies to everything, not just Bayesian analysis, but all kinds of physical modeling. Highly recommend his book. Some more background on Bayesian stuff. Uh, Gelman's book, Gelman et al., their book, data, Bayesian Data Analysis, is uh, uh, considered a... Um, the place to go for understanding a lot of this stuff. It is not, however, an easy read. So I wouldn't make it your first. Uh, Sivia and Hausen and Erbach also good. That is all. Let me pause, see if you have any questions. If you want to get in touch with me anytime in the future, that is four ways to get in touch with me. Thoughts, questions? There's actually a fifth way if we add blog to that. Uh, AlanDanny.com slash blog. <laughs> okay, the alignment doesn't work anymore, but that's, I have a, a blog called uh, Probably Overthinking It. I wonder if I have. <laughs> to it. I do not. Any questions? Four hours is a long time and we have done a lot of stuff. I hope it sunk in. I hope you had some fun. I appreciate your patience and determination and grit. You made it to the end. I will stop there. Thank you all very much. <laughs>